But tonight we're going to ha listen to a talk um, on Islamic bioethics. And this talk is based on a course on Islamic bioethics from Hamad bin Khalifa Medical College in Qatar. <coughs> the talk will cover a discussion on Islamic bioethics with specific reference to how religious authorities and medical authorities in the Middle East Islamic world construct policies regarding the beginning of human life, a two-stage process, and how to determine the end of human life. Time permitting, and I hope we have the time, we may be discussing the Islamic thinking on euthanasia, assisted rep reproductive technologies, and abortion. So this is um, Ms. Victoria in a hat. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> anyway, uh, let me uh, read to you a little bit about Victoria. She has a wonderful past, but we pulled out just a few things. So Victoria completed her undergraduate studies at St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Great Book School. She began graduate school in Hebrew and Jewish studies at the Hebrew, Hebrew University in Jerusalem before moving to Toronto to continue theological studies at St. Michael's College, University of Toronto. She completed theological studies with a concentration in early Christian studies at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. Victoria has taught world religions at a variety of colleges and universities. Her research interests include Syriac Christianity, pre-modern military history, sustainable and environmental issues, and the intersection between science and religion. Let's welcome Miss Victoria Earhart. Thank you. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> Didn't know there was this much competition. All right. You're on YouTube. Actually, I am. Uh, I wish to accomplish two goals in this presentation in Islamic bioethics. I mean, that poor patient, you know. Okay, the guys in the white turbans, those are doctors. All right. I want to provide a bias neutral information about Muslims and Islam to counter, uh, counteract what I think is the very ignorant and biased information available to us in our media. And I also want to provide a description of a different model for how science and religion can compete, uh, can collaborate with one another rather than compete. Because the need to collaborate in the social management of science and technology grows increasingly urgent with the availability of AI technology, genetic engineering. These are all based on profit motives with very little thought that I can see for the social and ethical consequences. Okay. So this isn't a paper containing new insights into embryogenesis because I'm not the person to do that. Reputable science is clearly, <coughs> it's readily available to everybody who wants to accept it or deny it or ignore it or reinterpret it based on a pre-existing mindset. What I want to focus on in this talk is the relationship of science and religion that respects insights from both fields of study. Okay. So uh, 50 of the... Can the mic so that we can, have the, we can hear it on the recording when we go back and listen to it again? Because this is so rich. Turn it a little bit towards you. If I touch this mic, it falls apart, all right? That's good. All righty, here we go. Fifty of the world's countries are majority Muslim. And there are more Muslims than Catholics in the world. There are more Christians than Muslims, but there are more Muslims than Catholics. So it makes sense to take a look at how science and religion interact in bioethics from an Islamic perspective. So. Uh, I would like to begin our examination of modern Islamic bioethics with the briefest of introductions to the religious tradition of Islam. So the foundational figure of Islam is the Prophet Muhammad and you can see here his face is veiled. Anyone who has been the center of God's undivided attention is 
transformed. Moses came down from Sinai with rays. Okay, and we can thank Michelangelo for the devil's horn. What an idiot. All right? But so you never see the face of the Prophet Muhammad. Once he has had his conversations with God, he is a different kind of person. He's a person, but he's a different kind of person. So his face is veiled. All right, so he's the foundational figure in Islam. He was born to the tribe of Quraysh in Mecca, in present-day Saudi Arabia. He was born in 570 of the Common Era into a reasonably prosperous family. He was orphaned at a young age. He was raised by his uncle who taught him the family business, which was the import-export trade, which is why there's a great deal of business and accounting metaphors and stories in the Quran, which I sometimes used when I taught business technology classes. <laughs> But then I also used clips from The Sopranos in my human resource management class because I thought Tony Soprano had unique ways of dealing with HR problems. <laughs> <coughs> Definitively. Now, both Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia were important caravan cities on the Silk Road. Okay, So there's some of his dates, but that's the Prophet Muhammad. Here's where we are. Mecca and Medina. Look on the west coast, the Red Sea. Okay. Mecca, the airport is in Jeddah. Medina is a little bit north. Okay. These are important caravan cities on the Silk Road. So Muhammad grew up exposed to a variety of religions represented in Mecca. And he gained a reputation for honesty in his business dealings. He was hired by a wealthy widow, Khadijah, to manage her import-export caravans. And they eventually married and had six children no sons survived into adulthood. This thing's touchy. Okay. Now, this fact will be of pivotal importance in Islamic history, but we know he had at least one daughter who survived into adulthood, Fatima, and she married Ali, with whom she had two sons. So, like Abraham, Muhammad was a thoughtful, pious man. He was drawn towards monotheism, while living amidst a sea of very tribally based polytheism. So in 610, when he was 40 years old, he began to <coughs> experience vivid psychological episodes, uh, revelations. The primary revelation to Muhammad was an insistence on the return to strict ethical monotheism. Islam considers the revelations to the Prophet Muhammad to be the same revelation preached by Abraham and by Moses and by Jesus and the biblical prophets. Worship of the one true God. Islam considers the revelations to Moses and Jesus as true and correct, but these are later messed up by their followers. So, Muhammad and the early followers thought that the Jews and Christians would recognize the truth of this recent, more recent iteration of revelations to Muhammad and that they would adjust their beliefs and behaviors accordingly. And this did not happen. So what did he preach? Well, he preached the, the five pillars of Islam, the profession of faith. There is no God but God, one and one only. Okay, we've heard that before. Prayer, generally five times a day. Fasting during the month of Ramadan, which is when the Quran began to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, almsgiving or charity, okay, tithing. 2% of your gross income, but I don't do people's taxes, all right? And if possible, at, at least once, in a pious Muslim's life to make the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. Okay? So th to me, th these seem very similar to um, major components of faith in Christianity and Judaism. Okay? So Muhammad's preaching of strict ethical monotheism was not at all well received in polytheistic Mecca and it interfered with business. So he was forced out of town with his fall, small group of followers, and they fled from Mecca to Medina. So they fled north, okay, away from the coast, in 622 of the Common Era, or the year 1, Anno Hijra, 
So the Muslim calendar begins in the year 622 in the Common Era. So always remember to check your Muslim dates to make sure which numbering system you're in. So this flight is called the Hijra in Arabic and it serves as the model for the Hajj every year, which I believe is still the world's largest concentration of people every year, over a million people. Okay. All right, and some of those million people are at the Grand Mosque in Mecca with the Kaaba. That, see that black cube in the middle? That was pre-Islamic and the idols of the tribes were contained in that Kaaba. And when Muhammad returned to Mecca, he did not take any religious vengeance on anyone, but he did clean out the, the idols in the Kaaba. Okay? So that is, in theory, a million people circumambulating that Kaaba in prayer during the Hajj. And Medina was just a little mud hut when Muhammad was there, but that is now the Mosque of the Prophet in Medina, okay? So Muhammad returns to Mecca, institutes uh, ethical monotheism in there. He dies in 632, so he's back in Mecca for 10 years. Dies in 632 and he leaves no son to succeed him as head of the community. Two options. Some thought the community should be led by a male relative closest to Muhammad, and that would be his son-in-law, Ali. Uh, other, others of the community thought that um, a, a pious man from among the community should be the leader. Now, Ali died in 661, and Islam split into the two branches. The vast majority of Muslims globally belong to the Sunni, branch, S-U-N-N-I, the Sunni branch. The followers of Ali formed the branch called Shiite Islam, or the Shias. And today, to this day, the Islamic Middle East continues to suffer this Muslim-Muslim violence that dates back to the seventh century. So we deal with this problem as well. When Muhammad was still alive, people began to write down and collect his preachings. And like Jesus, Muhammad's preaching ministry was exclusively oral. His preachings were collected into the Quran, the sacred text of Islam, okay? The Holy Quran, okay? Or if you need it in Spanish, El Quran, okay? <laughs> and there are, like, like British and Foreign Bible Society, you need to make this available in the languages, in the vernacular, so that people can read them, okay? I took my first class in Islam after I'd moved to Jerusalem, and we used this text. It's called the Noble Quran. It's published by Tel Aviv University, which is not a hotbed of Quranic studies by any means, as you can imagine. But this is an exquisite book in that the footnotes of the Quran are geared to the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, and the Talmud because it is the same material in this. And so somebody has done a moderately acceptable English translation, but the footnotes are gold, okay? And you can still get this on Almighty Amazon if you're interested. There's nothing particularly in, uh, special about this copy of the Quran, except that it's mine. And I bought it, I bought it in Istanbul on the street of the booksellers that had been there since the Ottoman Empire. And you can look at it, it's beautiful. But it took over an hour because we had to go to the mosque to get the, the mufti to grant permission for me to buy a copy of the Quran because I'm a non-Muslim and would it be respectful of the Quran to sell this book to me? So it involved a, a long conversation with, with the mufti 
in very poor German, to try and figure out, you know, was I a godly enough person to sell the book to? So anyway, that's my copy. There is another book, the Hadith, H-A-D-I-T-H, the Hadith. These are sayings of the Prophet Muhammad that didn't make it into the Quran. Okay, so it, it's a chain of transmission. You can't claim, these are going to be important because you can't claim anything as authoritative unless you can tie it to, and the prophet said. So these are so-and-so heard so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who heard it from so-and-so who heard the prophet say. And then you have a teaching. And this is just one volume. I think there are 174 volumes. I didn't bring them all. So um, the Quran and the Hadith and possibly the medieval life of Muhammad. Those are the three authoritative sources if you want to quote in order to have a textual basis for an opinion. Okay? Now, like the letters of St. Paul, the preachings, the Quran is not organized chronologically or by topic, which makes it very difficult to look things up. The 114 surahs or chapters, surah, uh, they're arranged like St. Paul's letters, longest to shortest. I mean, who thought of that? Right? So if you read basically, uh, except for chapter one, which is an opening prayer. So if you read chapter two, Surah two of the Quran, you pretty much covered it, okay? Because it's a huge long chapter, hundreds of verses. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter as you go. All right, those teachings of Muhammad not included in the Quran or in the Hadith. Now, the Quran is not a medical text, though it does contain bits and pieces of information on medical topics. So during the pre-modern period, Muslims depended on verses from the Quran. And you still see today in, in rural Islamic people wearing rural Islamic, um, the countryside, particularly little kids, they're wearing amulets with, with verses of the Quran as, as protectors. You know, the same way we wear, some people wear jewelry or some people wear um, other amulets, if you will. Okay? So they were, they, dependent upon verses from the Quran and uh, whatever texts from the Greco-Roman tradition had been translated into Arabic. So Pliny's Natural History, Aristotle, uh, Galen, all of those, okay, but basically the thinking was God is the healer par excellence. God knows who will be healthy, God knows who will suffer disease and illness, and it is better to trust in God than in doctors. How many people still believe that? Okay. Now, Islam did develop medical knowledge that the Crusaders found useful. There's the opening of the Quran, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, okay? Islam did develop medical knowledge that the Crusaders found useful, and it was much advanced from anything that we had in the West. And there are two Hakims, two doctors, again, the white turbans, and there is that poor pharmacist trying to fill their prescriptions for things. Right. They had a quite developed pharmacology already by the 13th century. All right? So we're going to leave Islam, medieval Islam, behind. I don't think it's an exaggeration to state that modern Islamic bioethics began on the 25th of July in 1978. Does that mean anything to anybody? 25 July, 1978, that's the birth of Louise Brown the world's first in vitro fertilization baby carried to full term and live birth, okay? And medical professionals all over the world the next day ask, <laughs> woke up and ask one another, what does this mean, okay? So, this led to the establishment of bioethics institutes in the Islamic world. The first one was the Islamic Fiqh Academy. It's in Mecca. It's you put a bioethics institute in Vatican City, you know what you're going to get. Okay. Um, well, that's who funds it, so that's what you get. All right. So the second one, uh, the International Fiqh Academy, the, the legal fakwa, uh, is in Jeddah, which is right outside Mecca. 
Okay. All right, finally, uh, in 1984, we get the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait. This is a big one. And then, um, this surprised me, it was this early. In 1967, there was an Islamic Medical Association of North America established. This is for Muslims who live outside the Muslim Middle East. There is now also um, an Islamic Bioethical Institute or Legal Institute or Sharia Institute in the United Kingdom for British Muslims. Okay. There's currently no medical uh, bioethics institute in Iran to represent the Shiite perspective, which, surprisingly to me, differs from the majority Sunnah perspectives on, on some topics. Uh, these first three primary institutes, they hold conferences uh, involving both medical professionals and religious scholars. They are in topics in bioethics, science, medicine, Conference participants submit their papers, uh, technical papers are summarized for the religious scholars, and then the people meet and they engage in a process of collective reasoning called ijtihad, interdisciplinary communication toward a common goal, that religious scholars and scientists are co-muftis or co-authorities. They have to work together, okay? I think this is a process quite distinct from the secular process of medical reasoning in the West, which is why I was interested in taking this Islamic bioethics class that no one at the university in Qatar could understand why I was in the class, but people wash ashore in religious studies departments for the strangest of reasons. Okay. We shall see how this process of interpretation of what are called the occasions of revelations to Muhammad, how these uh, teachings in the Quran are incorporated into the resulting fatwas or religious decisions written in response to medical and scientific summaries presented at these conferences and then the process of discussion and debate, argument ensues, okay? So each institute publishes the conference papers and summaries, and the institute in Kuwait publishes the transcripts of the arguments, which, uh, yeah, that, that's where, when it gets down and dirty, that's what you want to read. Now, the resulting fatwas, okay? I know, everybody's heard of fatwa because the Ayat Allah Khomeini made a fatwa against the author Salman Rushdie, and everybody thinks fatwas are bad things, but it simply means a religious ruling or decision, okay? It's, it's a formal ruling on an interpretation on a point of Islamic law, and it, by, given by a qualified legal scholar known as a mufti. Now, this I found interesting. They are considered authoritative, but not absolutely binding. There is still room for minority opinions. A requester who finds, and you can request a fatwa. I have this problem, what do I do? It's exactly what the people did with the rabbis in the Talmud. Right? We have this problem, what do we do? Right? So a requester who finds a fatwa unconvincing, unattractive, not what I was shopping around for, is permitted to seek another opinion. Okay, so these are authoritative but not binding. They're majority opinions is what they are, right? fatwas. Um, so there's still room for minority opinions and as I said, the Institute of Kuwait not only publishes the arguments but sometimes they publish the mini minority opinions as well. So, so it, it reminds me of uh, US Supreme Court decisions where you can read the dissenting opinions when they excoriate each other. Um, this process of, of collective reasoning or ijtihad, it's not confined just to religious scholars. Uh, think how much of our scientific work is now interdisciplinary, right, Gary? Interdisciplinary. You've got to get people from other fields. So it's also the product of collective input and collective reasoning. Fatwas can also be revised when new information and new problems arise, okay? So they're not 
static by any means. Ijtihad is a dynamic process. It goes on every couple of years. There's a meeting at one of the, the three <coughs> institutes in either Saudi Arabia or Kuwait about whatever problem has come up. I know in the next year or two there's going to be a conference on artificial intelligence and, and the Quran and, and what do we do with this. Okay? So, Beginning in the 1970s, when this became a problem, uh, the field of medicine in the Muslim world uh, gained enormous prestige, and it expanded to, to fill additional aspects of daily life. Healthcare decisions became maybe medicalized, and as more young doctors from the Muslim world who had trained in the West returned to their home countries, the medical curriculum became more secular. It also became much more technical. It became more secular, and it shifted from Arabic into English so that I could take a class at the University of Qatar at Ibn Khalifa, and it was more or less in English. Okay. This presents challenges to Muslim religious authorities who trained in classical Arabic advances in the medical sciences from since the 1970s have not been matched by advances in Quranic studies and this is a problem but I think I could say the same of the West that advances in ethics and legal protections have not kept pace with advances in science and technology so this problem is not unique to the Muslim world they simply address it differently. Okay, so there are a number of competing models that, that, or models that we could use to balance the competing claims of science and religion. We can just ignore religion entirely. We've done that. We can reinterpret religious data or religious texts, and we frequently do that. How do you apply these, these texts f from societies that are much different Morally speaking, they may not be that much different, but sociologically, psychologically speaking, they are much different. How do we still use these texts, right? You must deal with this every day. When you sit down to write your sermon, you go, what does this? <laughs> How am I going to sell this this week? Okay, so reinterpret the scriptures. Uh, people can reject what's in front of their face. We do it all the time. We can reinterpret the sense data to fit uh, a pre-existing mindset. We do that all the time. Or we can also simply just reject the claims of science, which we do all the time too. Okay. So those are different models that we can use. None of them are particularly enlightening. In the secular West, I claim that when religious claims conflict with scientific evidence, then the religious claims are rejected. Okay? Islam uses a different model. It, it reinterprets the religious data or the religious texts. Okay, it's axiomatic that the Quran, which is the eternal and final word of God cannot be wrong. That's axiomatic. God does not lie. We can get it wrong, but God doesn't lie. So in cases in which current science contradicts statements in the Quran, those verses then have to be interpreted metaphorically, allegorically, some other way, analogically, some other way than literally. Okay? But this also can be highly debated among Muslim religious authorities. Muhammad Khali, he was my teacher. He was my teacher uh, for the class. Uh, if you want, if you're interested in Islamic bioethics, much of it is not going to be available. Uh, I had problems getting stuff through interlibrary loan through UNM, but uh, this article in Zygon should be reasonably available. He says, it is important to note that the Quran and the Hadith, those sayings 
of Muhammad that are not included in the Quran, that the Quran and the Hadith are considered permanent and valid, whereas scientific and medical information is contingent and subject to change. I think this, in a nutshell, points to the major difference in how science and religion relate to one another in the Muslim world and the secular West. So let's begin with a question of when does human life begin? Start with something simple, right? When does human life begin? The Quran contains a number of verses relevant to the creation of humans in both their physical and <coughs> metaphysical aspects. So, surah means chapter. Surah 22.5. We created you from dust, then a drop of seed, then we formed a little clot, then a little lump of flesh, and we cause that you will remain in the womb for an appointed time, and afterward we bring you forth as infants, then give you growth, that you will attain your full strength. Okay? So, created you from the dust. Or, I am creating a mortal out of potter's clay of black mud. So when I have made him and have breathed into him my spirit, do ye, and he's talking to the angels, do ye angels fall down, prostrating yourselves unto him. Okay, so Surah 22, completely physical. Surah 15, gives us an indication that there is a metaphysical component, an other than physical component, to the creation of a human, okay? Um, I think it's worth noting, as an aside, that there is extensive argument in both the Muslim and the Jewish texts of angelology where the angels beg God not to create humans because they are nothing but trouble. <laughs> But we're both. We are physical and metaphysical, and the Quran acknowledges that. Okay? So neither the Quran nor the Hadith are, are texts on embryogenesis, nor is the Bible. So from these two texts, Islamic bioethicists have derived uh, a number of positions, a number of fatwas. Okay? So when does human life begin? Pick a time, right? Pick a time. So, if we have a fatwa that says human life begins at conception, then I can look in the Quran. I have to look someplace to find a theological point on which to hang my fatwa. We alone created humans from a drop of mixed fluids in order to test them, so we made them hear and see. Okay, from a drop of fluid. So this is human life or some kind of life begins at conception. In Surah 53, we, life that we might consider human life begins when a fertilized egg implants in the uterine wall. The Lord is vast in forgiveness. He is most knowing. He produced you from the earth and when you were fetuses in the wombs of your mothers. Okay, so I've got some basis on which to argue that it's not just a fertilized egg, but when, it's when the egg implants. But I also have a fatwa that says embryogenesis is an extremely gradual project, process. You can't point to now, before something, after human. Can't point to any one specific plant. Here is the beginning of human life. I also have a fatwa that says it begins at 40 days from conception. Okay, created everything from clay, fashioned them, then had a spirit of his own creation breathed into them. Again, the definition of a person as both physical and metaphysical. And it gave you hearing, sight, and intellect. Yeah? Physical and metaphysical. We have a fatwa that says when the brain and nervous system show specific markers of development in neurobiology, or when the brain takes its more or less full shape in the 12th week, 
where we have 100, a fatwa for the 120 days after fertilization. This is from a hadith. It's not from the Quran. It's from the hadith of Ibn Ma'asud. The creation of one of you is put together in his mother's womb in 40 days. Okay, so that's the first 40. Then he becomes a clot of congealed blood for a similar period. So we're up to 80. And then a little lump for a similar period. 120 days. Okay. My point is every fatwa has to have a religious basis. Okay. And these religious bases form public policy in Muslim countries. Okay. Islamic theology and bioethics makes a difference between a living entity and a human being. Okay. This is similar to the, the distinction between a human and a, a human and a fetus that's in Exodus. Men are fighting and one of them smacks a woman who's pregnant and there's a miscarriage and yet no harm follows except for the miscarriage. Okay. The one who hurt the woman shall be fined according as the woman's husband shall lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But there is no fine for the damage to the fetus, because a fetus is not a person. This is the same distinction that Islam makes. Okay? All the majority positions in Islamic bioethics argue that insolment is the marker of human life. Prior to insolment, an embryo qualifies as a living entity. It possesses dignity, okay? But only after insolment does that li is that living entity considered a human being and therefore acquires sanctity. It is a two-stage process, dignity, sanctity. I think that's a helpful distinction. Okay. I like this. This is a, a 15th century Persian illustration. That is an angel. You can see the angel's blue wings coming out from there. Okay. Again, a hadith, an al-Bukhari. Then Allah sends an angel who is ordered to write down four things on the soul. He is ordered to write down the person's deeds, his livelihood, his date of death, and whether he will be blessed or wretched, and then the soul is breathed into him. Okay? That's the marker of a person. Okay? You like the angel? Predestination. Um, big time. <laughs> Allah knows. There are four things we're never supposed to ask Allah. Will it be a boy or a girl? Will it rain tomorrow? When will I die? What will my life be like? Okay. Don't do it. <laughs> Fatwas regarding neonatal medical situations insist upon this distinction between dignity and sanctity before and after insolment. Medical decisions and procedures are formulated with this medical, within this physical and metaphysical framework. Okay. But all participants in this conference on the question of when does human life begin, they all, all the fatwas recognize that religious scholars who do not take new medical information into consideration are mistaken in their judgments. It is not sufficient to quote earlier fatwas, the need for collective ijihad, it remains ongoing. Conference participants recognized, uh, you have the religious authorities themselves, these are the grand muftis. They recognize that religious rulings not based on current medical and scientific evidence by their own admission should and will be disregarded by the general Muslim population. I, I stress this point because both scientific and religious opinions in Islamic bioethics are stated as, um, as, as provisional. Okay? They allow ongoing room for collect collective ijtihad. 
And I think this is unlike the entrenched and unhelpful positions of science versus religion in the West. I think both science and religion need to rein in their tendencies towards epistemological arrogance. And we would all be better off. Because we have different opinions on, on how to define uh, the beginning of human life in bioethics, we're going to, we have different fatwas. Uh, each is based on a religious reference, but we're also going to have differences of opinion on abortion, right? Okay, so here's a couple. Do not destroy a life that Allah has declared sacred, except for a just cause. Kill not your children for fear of poverty. It is we, God, who will provide for them and for you. The killing of them is a great sin, okay? Most fatwas state that only medically necessary abortion is permitted and then only to save the life of the mother. If medically necessary, then abortion must be performed prior to the 120 days. That is prior to insolment, when it has dignity but not sanctity. After insolment, a fetus possesses dignity and sanctity. Okay. So there is a slippery slope argument as to exactly when an embryo becomes a human and religious authorities are in agreement that insolment, the metaphysical definition, is the defining marker. Science and biomedical information are secondary. I think that is the reverse in the West. A minority fatwa does uh, allow for an abortion if the fetus will be born with serious genetic def defect or health condition or if carrying the pregnancy to term would uh, impose a very heavy psychological burden on the woman. Exceptions are also made in case if the woman is pregnant in a war zone and lacks access to medical facilities. Sharia law, which is what we're talking about. Basically, we would, might call it family law. It's, it's not about inheritance and property. And that. It's, it's about family law. Sharia law allows for kind of facts on the ground exceptions in specific cases where a majority fatwa would impose an undue burden on either the woman or the married couple. Fatwas are not zero tolerance, zero discretion decisions. We don't hear too much about that in the West. Okay. Now, Issues, like in the West, issues surrounding the status of embryos are very complex. Can the surplus fertilized eggs be destroyed? Can surplus fertilized eggs be used in research? The principle of public benefits, a kind of ethical utilitarianism, exists in Sharia law. So the religious authorities ask themselves, do the possible public benefits of stem cell research outweigh the insult to the dignity of the surplus fertilized eggs? The destruction of surplus fertilized eggs is permitted under Sharia law because it is an unavoidable consequence of the process of in vitro fertilization in which more than one egg is fertilized. The destruction of the surplus fertilized eggs is termed unavoidable abortion. It is a, a necessary but secondary consequence. There is no possibility that a surplus fertilized egg can be donated and implanted in another woman. This is forbidden in Sharia law. There is no option for surrogacy or for a couple to adopt a surplus fertilized egg adoptions which are available in the West. Okay. The issue of whether surplus fertilized eggs can be used in embryonic research 
has only recently arisen in Islamic bioethics because they simply didn't do this in the Islamic world. Existing fatwas do, however, make a distinction between a surplus fertilized egg and a fertilized egg attached to a uterine wall. The latter possesses dignity, but the unattached egg possesses at most partial dignity. So all of the rights of a fetus do not obtain pre-fetus stage, pre ensoulment Neither egg possesses sanctity. Okay. Preference is in the fatwas given to a third option, and that is to let the surplus eggs thaw and be allowed to die in a natural way. Chicken, but this option does not involve direct aggression against the, the life of the egg. Okay. How are we doing for time? Okay. In terms of assisted reproductive technologies, Sunni and Shiite Islam are quite different. I did not know this. So, we have two quotations in the Quran. Surah 42. Unto God belongs the sovereignty of the heavens and the earth. God creates what God wills. God bestows female offspring on whom God wills and male offspring on whom God wills. God mingles male and female offspring and makes barren whom God wills. That seems to about cover everything. Okay. However, Surah 21. This is the birth of John the Baptist. This is the story of John the Baptist in the Quran. We find this in Luke's Gospel, right? Zechariah cried unto God, My God, leave me not childless. I thought you were the best of all inheritors. Then we heard his prayer and bestowed upon him John and transformed his wife to bear a child for him. And she was chaste. Therefore we breathed into her of our spirit and made her and her son a sign for all peoples. Just as an aside, there's a great deal of information about Christianity in the Quran. It is accurate and it is sympathetic. Muhammad knew a great deal about Christianity from his travels on the Silk Road. He must have met other Christian monks and uh, other Christian import-export traders. I think these two quotations sum up the positions in Islam for the use of assisted reproductive technologies, both of them a specific Quranic verse. Position one, absolutely rejects all forms of assisted reproductive technology. Position two, the John the Baptist, it allows for some use of some assisted reproductive technologies. No religious authority unconditionally allows assisted reproductive technologies. So with regard to the limited acceptance of assisted reproductive technologies, Collective Ijtihad asks, is Act X using assisted reproductive technologies in conformity with God's will? God wills that a person achieve both good in this world and in the next. Will this Act X using this permitted assisted reproductive technology, will this act cause more benefit than harm? This is again the, the position, the principle of, of ethical utilitarianism at work in Sharia law. Fatwas are very rarely abstract principles. They are based on specific cases in people's lived realities and these realities are just sometimes too complex to be divided into absolute moral categories of good and bad or permitted or forbidden. Okay? Assisted reproductive technologies exist in that huge gray area between permitted and forbidden. Best is if you don't use it, but your wives are a place of sowing seed for you. So come to your place of cultivation however you wish. Okay, but fear God and know that you will meet God at some point, okay? 
So the morally responsible use of assisted reproductive technology prohibits the use of any third party. Okay. No third party can contribute any reproductive material that contains genetic characteristics. Don't even think CRISPR. Not in the Muslim world. Not now. There is no surrogacy under any circumstances. Except. <laughs> and this surprised me greatly in class. Shiite religious authorities in Iran have adopted a much more permissive view, something I would not normally expect from the very austere ayatollahs. Shiite Islam allows embryo and sperm donation as part of infertility treatments. Iran in 2005 became the only Muslim country to legally permit this assisted reproductive technology. And I have been trying for months to get my hands on a transcript of that debate because I want to know the legal reasoning, okay? In, uh, in about the 1980s, at the same time, bioethics had to address questions and problems related to when a human life begins, advances in successful organ donation and transplantation required Islamic bioethics to confront the question of when does a human life end? That's not so simple anymore, okay? What constitutes human death? Is brain death a legitimate determinant of human death now that other organs can continue to function using artificial means. I think in some ways we are back at the beginning when human life was determined by ensoulment. Human death, according to the fatwas, occurs when the soul separates from the body. So how is this determined? I love this one. They will ask you concerning the spirit or the soul. Say, the spirit of the soul is by command of God and of knowledge. We have been given but little. Are you going to hear a Western doctor tell you that? <clears throat> right? They're just going to, oh, well, you know, this works, this works, this doesn't, this doesn't, add them all up. Okay, dead. All right? Uh, there's a much more nuanced definition of what it means to be human. We have to take the metaphysical into account. Okay? One conventional definition of human death is when irreversi irreversible loss of respiration has occurred, but with CPRs and ventilators, that's, that's no longer so helpful. Nor is there a widely agreed upon definition of brain death yet among either religious specialists or medical specialists, especially now that essentially brain-dead people can be kept physically or at least minimally alive on life support. Religious authorities are, I think, rightly skeptical of this argument of neurological reductionism that equates brain death with full human death. Both sides in this discussion are trying to avoid entanglements from a slippery slope argument, but just how does one determine with absolute certainty when a coma or brain death is irreversible? Physicians cannot as yet give us an informed opinion of when precisely the soul leaves the body. So one of the conclusions of the conference on the topic of brain death as definitive death is the idea that the soul is not entirely a metaphysical concept. Quite interesting. There are physical indicators of consciousness that denote the presence of the soul in the body. The soul controls volitional actions of the body and some sensory perceptions. And when these 
functions cease irreversibly, this constitutes evidence for the religious authorities that the soul has left the body. And until quite recently, this was the agreed upon marker of human death. But Saudi Arabia and Qatar, hence this class, pass legislation establishing brain death as the legal definition of death over the objections of the religious scholars in this case. Said you cannot reduce a person to just the physical. You must take cognizance of the metaphysical components of a person as well. Okay, um, yeah. The answer to when a, a person is legally dead is necessary to answer questions concerning organ donation and transplants. Okay. Earlier arguments uh, were against this. Organ donation and transplantation is mutilation because the body possesses sanctity. God is the owner of one's body. And the success rate of organ transplantation was low. But beginning in the late 70s, 80s, the Grand Mufti of Egypt shifted fatwas in the direction allowing blood transfusions, skin grafts, corneal transplants, and finally organ transplants, as long as the dignity of both the donor and recipient are respected. So now organ transplantation is judged to be no more than any other kind of required surgery. Why should we do this? This is a beautiful saying from Surah 5. Whoever kills a man, a human being, it shall be as if he had killed all mankind. Whoever saves the life of one human being, it shall be as if he saved the life of all mankind. We also find this in the Talmud, but you need to save that person because that, that one person possesses sanctity, okay? And it is now acceptable for a Muslim to receive an, an organ donated from a non-Muslim. Uh, this was a big, this was a big deal. Um, and the fatwa said, no, it, it, religion makes much more, one's, one's personal religion makes much more sense in the afterlife than here. Okay, as long as it is a good person who has lived the purity of life, that organ is fine, okay? Fatwas dealing with end of life issues make a clear distinction, again, I think this is helpful, between saving a life and keeping a terminally ill patient minimally alive through medical intervention. Fatwas take cognizance of quality of life. Human life, I get that, all human life possesses sanctity, but it also possesses markers of quality. If medical intervention will not restore a patient to an acceptable quality of life, then medical intervention should not be applied or should maybe withdrawn if it's already been applied. What matters is the closeness to God one has towards the end of one's life. And this idea is part of the public policy of pain management. If you had to medicate someone into imbecility, they're no longer conscious of their relationship to God. How is that helpful, right? So pain management to a degree, but that kind of pain management may make us unconscious about the world. Uh, active euthanasia is forbidden. I'm always okay. um, Pain management that as a secondary effect may shorten the person's life, that is allowable. Okay. But active euthanasia at this point is not. So the end of life issue in the Quran, and here is the Hadith, and this is Muhammad speaking. None of you should make a wish to die because of damage or disease or illness that was struck. If it is unavoidable, then you should pray to God, O oh God, whenever life is better for me, then let me live. And whenever death is better for me, then let me die. Ultimately, the outcome resides, I think, in God's hands. 
Thank you for the privilege of your time.